So what I'd like to do first is to uh, thank you all for coming because I forget at the end. Mm -hmm. uh, so <clears throat> I'd like to start by, everybody know what this book is? Mm -hmm. You all seen on there everywhere, right? Started in the early 90s and now they proliferated to just a bunch of these books out there. So I started thinking, well, why not? So this is how we're going to, this is what we're going to use as the carcass for this talk is uh, if this were a stable isotope for dummy, you know how these books are made. They have parts inside and uh, then you go through each part. So here's what we're going to talk about. The first four are going to be lots about instruments, lots of moving gases, things moving up and down. I'll describe them as we go along. Uh, the first one is sample preparation, and here I've got a little ISO tree, and those of you in the lab will, will see that each one of these little branches up here is a different sample preparation system that you're going to be exposed to in the next two weeks. We have this upstart down here, this new little bud for optical systems, which we'll talk about a little bit, and one of the groups is doing water analysis right now, which is being done on this optical system. Okay, so the easiest gases we look at are pure gases like CO2 in breath, CO2 in the atmosphere, things like that. Those are the easiest sample preps because you don't have to do anything with them except perhaps purify them, put them in the instrument. The instrument that people are going to use, the use today and all of you are going to use in the next two days is the dual inlet. This is classic technology and I can sit here and, and tell that everybody in here, most of you will never ever use a dual inlet. But as a group, those of us that have been involved with this for the last 21 years, we thought you should be exposed to it at least once in your life. So one group got it today and the other two groups will get it. But I can tell you right now, the dual inlet is the absolute best way to run numbers. You get your most precise numbers. Here's how it works. Uh, the dual inlet, these are little valves. This is the actual instrument out here. And dual inlet implies that there's two sides. And one thing you need to remember about stable isotope analysis is we always compare an unknown sample to a known sample. So in the dual inlet, we've got one side that's for a reference gas and one side for an unknown gas. And here's how it works. We uh, might send some gas in from a reference cylinder. Those of you in the lab, you'll see a cylinder that looks similar like this. It goes into a volume. It's like an accordion. It flexes, gets bigger and smaller. Sample side can be a gas which is sealed up in a tube. You can break it and release that gas. It'll go into a variable volume. And uh, then that gas, once it's in these volumes, can then be sent out through some valves into the mass spectrometer to get a signal that gets detected. And I'm going to tell you how this works coming, so hold on to that. Uh, and you get a signal. And this side here, though, you can see there's a little pressure gauge, and we've got a bit more gas on this side, and you see we've got a bigger signal. Uh, that's where these variable volumes come into play, because the, the best numbers we get, these are kind of matched, they're kind of the same. So what we do is we make this smaller, and, and the gas goes in faster, we get a higher signal. So those of you that did the dual inlet today, you did this, and those of you that will do it in the next two days, you'll, you'll play this game. Um, and a lot, you guys, if you have questions along the way, just let me know and we'll, and we'll stop. All right, so that's kind of the pure gas system. Uh, the next hardest one, which one of the groups is doing right now with your bulk CN analysis, is uh, looking at, in this case, combustion. So this is just taking organic material, burning it, separating the gases. Almost all labs do this now in, in using a system called continuous flow. All that means is you generate a gas someplace and you push it towards the instrument with an inert gas, in this case helium, and the instrument sniffs the peak it goes by and it calculates a ratio. Um, and here's, here's how this works. So this is a diagram of the elemental analyzer. It's got a combustion reactor, a reducer reactor, some way to remove water, a chromatograph to separate some gases, and then it goes off to the instrument. This works by putting some pure nit or oxygen into the system, uh, dropping a sample in. The sample catches fire, gets really hot, 1,800 degrees. That's pretty warm. 
Uh, when you do that, you form a, a variety of gases, one or two of which may be what you want, and the rest of them you don't really care about. So some of those are removed chemically here. Others are removed chemically here. Water is removed over here. And at the end of that, we end up with our product gases, in this case, carbon and uh, nitrogen, CO2 and nitrogen. Those guys go onto the gas chromatograph. They get separated. Nitrogen moves on to the mass spectrometer and gets analyzed. And you see a chromatogram that's going to pop up and look something like this, where we have a, a pure, a known reference peak, an unknown nitrogen peak, giving us N15 values. And then the magic of the system is, so what's the mass of this guy? N2? 28, and what's the mass of this guy, CO2? 44. So the instrument between that peak right there and that peak right there has to switch all of its settings so that you can get multiple numbers off it. So it's pretty clever. And you'll see that when you do these uh, runs tomorrow. Uh, one thing, you have, as I mentioned earlier, everything that we do is compared to a known. So the isotopic value of this unknown N2 peak is compared to this guy, and the isotopic value of this CO2 peak is compared to this guy. That happens throughout everything you're going to do. Another way that we can do this is doing headspace analysis. And headspace analysis, I've diagrammed here with a CO2 equilibration. Did you talk about that, Tom? OK. Uh, this is a, a way to get the oxygen out of water by equilibrating CO2 in water and the oxygen is exchanged and you can look at the CO2, but the water has taken on the characteristics, or the CO2 has taken on the characteristics of the, uh, the water. And so th here's how this one works. This valve here is gonna move around a lot. So we have a double hole needle, which will push some sample out, take out the water, and then it just flows continuously. What we really want is just a a small aliquot of this. So we can do the same thing again, we can do there, and then this switches, and another helium source pushes it on to the GC column. So you can do this with equilibration, you can do it with breast samples, you can do it with dissolved inor inorganic carbonate, if you're doing that kind of stuff, if you're a rock person. Uh, you can do it with atmospheric samples, so it's a very versatile tool. Uh, one thing that you, one wants to be cautious using this system is that those of you that like to get concentrations, you want to know how much CO2 is in a sample. Uh, because this system is continuously diluted with helium, the peaks get a little smaller every time. So you have to be a little cautious with uh, concentrations, but the isotopes are good. Uh, and as you can tell, you can get averages of multiple peaks. So this is the gas bench which you guys will use at some point in the next, in the next 10 days. It gets a little harder here when we do uh, something called carbon reduction, or you might know it as TCA or temperature, temperature conversion, elemental analyzer, all kinds of names for it. But essentially what we do here is we have a very hot carbon oven, and when you drop something into that, you essentially break it into pieces. And those pieces, find what they need to make themselves a usable gas. So if we, we, and it can be done with either solids, in which case you drop it in, it breaks apart, or you can do it with liquids and inject, say, water into the system. Um, and in either case, what we're gonna form is, in the case of water, we're gonna form hydrogen gas at the end, so H2. Oh, and for oxygen, again, in the case of water, we'll form carbon monoxide. And as you can tell, these things all work the same way. We're going to get hydrogen coming off, and then the carbon dioxide will, will come off. So you can get two isotopes for the water sample. You can do solids. You can do cellulose, things like this. And I think you do these next week, those that are going to do oxygen and hydrogen. Um, and the chromatograms tend to look the same. So the hardest ones are what we call compound specific. Uh, those of you that want to do compound specific, the person to talk to about that arrived today. 
This guy? Yeah. Uh, so compound specific is a little different. As you remember those last uh, graphs, what we were doing is generating a gas and then separating gases through the gas chromatograph. Here we do it oppositely. We separate first on the gas chromatograph and then make a gas. So the key here is that if you take a fatty acid, which is not volatile, you have to do some offline preparation to make it volatile so you can then convert it. So you may have heard the term FAMES if you're a compound specific person. So you go from a fatty acid to a, an ester which is volatile and here's how this works. Um, let's say we had a mixture up here and we in inject this mixture in again to a helium stream and it goes to a gas chromatograph and it sits there and nothing happens. And we slowly increase the temperature of the gas chromatograph and at the right temperature the first fatty acid will come off goes down, gets combusted, uh, things are removed, and then analyzed. So this is opposite those other systems. Uh, word of warning on compound specific, this is the new kid on the block, which you get an awful lot of information out of, but the sample preparation can be a couple of weeks before you get here. Mm -hmm. So this is not for the faint at heart. Mm -hmm. And I think next week there'll be, my guess is one or two of you will be involved with doing something like this. Um, also, I, I changed this chromatogram a little bit because this happens where you might get two fatty acids that come out really close to each other and you've got to sort it out. So be, be careful with, uh, with compound specific. 